All right, well, welcome and thank you everybody for joining today's C2 Smart webinar. This is the second of a summer webinar series presented by the Transportation Research Board Subcommittee on Route Choice and Spatiotemporal Behavior. Today's topic is observing and modeling travel behavior using massive public transport data, which will be led by Professor Marcella A. Munizaga from the University of Chile. And we're also joined by subcommittee members, Professor Natalia Barber, Professor Roger Chen, and Professor Joseph Chow. And we will be recording this session and then uploading it to the C2 Smart YouTube channel. And then lastly, I want to encourage everybody to ask questions and participate. And you can do so by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window, and then we will read out the questions at the end. And with that, I will hand things over to Professor Chen to get us started. All right. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. Um, so as was mentioned, my name is Roger Chen. I'm from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And along with Joe Chow at NYU, we're the um, committee, the subcommittee chairs of the Subcommittee on Route Choice and Spatial Temporal Processes. Our parent TRB committees are AAP30 and AAP40, which are Traveler Behavior and Values and Network Modeling. Uh, and so today is the second uh, webinar of our summer webinar series. We have one more coming up um, in a few weeks, and we had one just last month with um, uh, Mogens Foscarau. Uh, and so as Lizzie mentioned, today our speaker is Marcela Munizaga from the University of Chile. Um, the title of her talk is Observing and Modeling Travel Behavior Using Massive Public Transport Data. Uh, Marcella is a transportation engineer from the University of Chile, and she has a PhD from the um, Catholic University of Chile. Uh, currently, she's a full professor there and also vice dean. She is no stranger to the travel behavior community, uh, and so she is very active in it. Uh, and she is currently um, vi vice president of the board of Metro de Santiago. Uh, from 2018 to 2022, she assumed the academic research direction of FCFM. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to turn it over to her so that she can uh, start on her excellent uh, talk. Okay. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. I will share my screen now. Okay, there we are. Okay, is it working? Yes, okay, good. Well, thank you for the, the presentation. Yeah, I'm, uh, as Roger was saying, a professor at University of Chile, and I am also part of uh, two research uh, institutes, one on complex engineering systems and another one on uh, climate uh, and resilience research. Um, well, with uh, my research group, uh, we have an aim, which is to develop tools that can be used uh, to take all the information that is available from technological device to use it in the benefit of our cities and, of course, citizens. So I have been some time working with the uh, data of our public transport system, which is called Transantiago. Uh, Santiago is a large public transport system that integrates buses, metro, and trains. Um, we have more than 11,000 bus stops, uh, over 6,000 buses, seven metro lines, and one train uh, line that uh, provide uh, 33 million bus, uh, trips per day. We, we move uh, 3 million passengers daily. The, the city has over 7 million inhabitants and we have uh, broadly um, one third of the trips are made by public transport, one third by car and, and one third by walking in Santiago. So this system uh, uh, generates large amounts of data daily and we have a long-term collaboration between the university and the Ministry of Transport. And we receive on this data, uh, our over 6,000 buses are all equipped with a GPS device that uh, sends a signal 
uh, every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, we know the GPS position of, the, of each bus. Um, and also one characteristic of our system is that you cannot pay by cash in any bus or metro. Uh, you can only pay uh, either with a smart card called BIP or with a QR uh, using your mobile phone. And all those uh, boarding transactions are recorded. Um, and we have also other information such, such as the definition of the routes, the assignment of, of buses to routes, the position of bus stops, etc. So we have these huge databases. We need to do some processing to obtain valuable information from the data. Um, a first uh, important uh, contribution that we made was to estimate the a lighting stop of boarding transactions uh, because in our system, we have a flat fare structure. Uh, the, the fare you pay does not depend on the length of the trip. Uh, it only depends on of, of how many trip stages you make. Um, so we only validate when boarding a bus or when, when entering a, a metro station. We don't, we don't have a tap off validation. So. Um, with my co-author Carolina Palma in 2012, we proposed this method where we estimate the um, a lighting stop based on the position of the next transaction. We have a, a very dense network, many uh, bus routes and, and metro lines. So we couldn't use some simpler methods that have been proposed in the literature before. Uh, we have to make a, a more sophisticated uh, estimation uh, looking for the uh, bus stop, which is more the more convenient to make the uh, next transaction. Let me explain, for example, if you got in a, in a bus uh, in this first transaction of the day position uh, in the morning, and then you make a transaction in a metro station, uh, we look for the possible bus stops where you could have combined uh, with the, that metro station, and we look for the most convenient. And for that, uh, we use this function, which is to minimize the generalized time between the position of the um, current bus stop and that of the next boarding. Because for example, here, uh, you have that this bus route went very near um, this metro station uh, and then went to another place and came back also near, actually closer um, to that uh, position of the, of the second transaction. But you would probably got off the bus in the first one because you don't want to ride like an hour in a bus to get one meter closer to the uh, next transaction. So with this method, we, we estimate the, um, the alighting position for every transaction. And we also estimate, uh, we try to identify the positions where um, passengers make a, a transfer between one uh, bus route to another or between bus and metro. Uh, from uh, positions where you actually go to perform an activity because for transport modeling, it's very important to differentiate that because the uh, trip stages are only uh, what you have to do because of the public transport you have. Uh, while the important in terms of uh, public policy is where people perform activities, where you need to go, where you are and where you need to go. So. Uh, for this, we also propose a method uh, which has also been, been published um, using a criteria that uh, considers the time between one, one transaction and, and the other, the, the sequence of transactions. For example, if you uh, make a transaction in the metro and then another transaction in metro, even though it, it can be a very short time, it is probably because uh, you have to perform an activity and, at that location because uh, to combine within Metro, you, you don't need to uh, get 
outside of the network and, and validate again. Well, uh, we, we did this, uh, we proposed these methods that are based on assumptions that we made that we consider very reasonable, but we had to validate uh, this. And for that, um, we, we, had, we, we were able to have some validation uh, samples. Uh, one of them was uh, from a um, survey ma made to Metro passengers where uh, it was an origin destination survey made at the Metro uh, station. Uh, but the, the, they also included the, a, a question regarding the card ID of the person. So we could uh, compare what people declare in the survey with what we were able to observe uh, with these methods we have uh, been proposing. Um, well, uh, passengers were very generous to, to provide uh, this, this data and we had a validation sample of 150,000 uh, surveys. Um, and we found that um, our estimation was correct within uh, a considering a, a one kilometer um, radio in 80% of the cases, which is a, a very large percentage. Uh, we also compare the uh, trip origin with the estimated boarding. boarding. You have to uh, consider that um, we observe boarding at a bus stop or uh, entering a, a metro or train station. We don't know the exact origin of the person, but in nearly 80% of the, of the cases, the origin of the trip was within one kilometer of that bus stop and, or, or that train station, which is also very high. Well, then if you compare uh, both things, because there is an 20% um, of uh, users that have a, where their origin is farther than one kilometer from the bus stop. And also uh, we have uh, this effect that um, we, fail to estimate uh, the alighting station in 20% of the cases, which uh, we also uh, observe that uh, if we compare the, trip, the exact trip, de trip destination with the estimated alighting, uh, uh, we had the correct information in 60% of the cases. So it's very consistent. We also made some validation with a sample of volunteers who were mostly um, students from the university and uh, people from the uh, San Santiago uh, Authority. And in that case, uh, uh, what we wanted to validate was this separation between trip stations and, and locations where people uh, went to perform activities. And we found with this sample of volunteers that 90% of our estimations were correct. Uh, this percentage is probably overestimated because uh, students and uh, public transport uh, works, people who work at the Public Transport Authority are probably um, frequent users of public transport, much more frequent than other users, regular users. Um, well, we, we also uh, try to do the same, or we actually did the same, with this last Santiago origin destination survey, which was made in 2012. Um, this, this was a home-based survey. And in this case, uh, very few people were uh, willing to provide us uh, their card uh, number to do this validation exercise, only 4% of the respondents. But the percentages we obtained were very similar to what we obtained in, in the other validation sample. Well, uh, we also did some validation uh, based on comparing what we obtained from this smart car data uh, and compare it with survey data. Uh, in this case, we have the comparison of uh, smart car uh, data uh, observations in one week um, compared to observed trips in the uh, 
Santiago Origin Destination Survey. In this case, what you observe is the time of day uh, when the trip begins and the histogram of that. You can see uh, that the shape that we observe is the same, but in the case of smart card data, it's like a, a very high quality picture, <laughs> while in the other case, it's a, a more uh, sparse, the, the information. And, and also in the case of the survey, you can observe this, uh, differences with very light and uh, high and, and lower uh, values, which is due to the fact that uh, when we ask people at, at what time do you begin your trip, people are more likely to declare at eight o'clock or at seven o'clock rather than at 8.37 with 50 seconds, which is what we obtain from the validation. Because in the case of the validations, we have the exact uh, time at which uh, the tree begin. But the shapes are the same, but in, in the case of smart car data, we have high definition quality, while in the, in the other case, we have uh, much more sparse. We also look at the uh, origin destination matrices uh, from this data. And if we use, for example, the um, sonification used for the Santiago origin destination survey, survey which is uh, around uh, 800 zones, 70, 793 zones. In the case of uh, smart card data, we found that in nearly 30% of the cells, we actually observe trips. While in the survey, uh, over 99% of the origin destination pairs at this level of aggregation, uh, no trip was observed. Now, from the modeling per perspective, there has also been the question of whether these zero cells in your origin destination matrices are zero uh, because you don't have enough sample to capture those trips or because they are actually zero and that there are no trips between a particular zone in one neighborhood and a particular zone in another neighborhood. If you look at this in another level of aggregation, for example, at municipality level, in Santiago, we have 38 municipalities that are covered by the Transantiago system. Um, in the case of the smart card data, you observe trips in all pairs of municipalities, while uh, in the survey, you have here some white and gray uh, cells all the white cells are cells where no trip was observed. While with the smart card data, you, you do have uh, trips between those origin destination pairs. Well, with, so with this data, this is a very dense data. Um, we begin working with this data in 2008. Uh, at the beginning, uh, they gave us the data in the CD and we have to Downloaded and it and it was difficult to process this data. Um, we took like like six months to obtain the first estimation of bus speeds, uh, origin destination matrices. Uh, but now uh, we receive the information online, the GPS information daily online online, and we receive the validation information with. A one week delay, but we uh, receive all the information of all day, so we can observe the behavior of public of the public transport system. We can look at the buses and we can look at the passenger behavior or car behavior. Actually, um, any day of the week, we can observe any time of day. Uh, we can observe long time behavior over. Uh, days, weeks, uh, years even. So uh, we basically uh, have been looking at uh, the operation in terms of the uh, speed profiles. This is the, the picture I have here. Also uh, several indicators about the system and also the passenger behavior through the origin destination matrices.
We can also uh, look with very much detail the uh, a particular bus in, in this uh, picture, for example, mm -hmm. uh, there are the load profiles by bus trajectory, uh, where you can see, uh, for example, where these lines uh, stick together is because there is bus bunching. Uh, and you can see what happens with the, um, with the uh, load of, of that bus. Uh, there is uh, uh, lots of crowding. These red uh, dots there show some crowding problems, uh, which are uh, incremented by the uh, bus punching. And, the, and in the right side of this picture, you can see the uh, origin destination matrix by route. So you can look at, at very detailed information. Uh, also in terms of indicators, uh, you can monitor what is happening with the, with the system. Here we have the 3.5 uh, million trips, which in average take uh, 36, 36 minutes and make 1.3 trip stages. Okay, so what can we use? What can be done with this data? Um, this data have, can and have been used for service design. For example, one of the first things that the people from the Transport Authority did was to identify uh, those cases where many users do, did the same transfer. So you have a number of passengers transferring from one service to another one, so you can merge. Uh, both of them, and uh, um, then those passengers will not have to do that uh, transfer. It has also been used for uh, ev the evaluation of the system, all, all this uh, data processes, processing that we do at the university is used by the transit authorities to evaluate the operators, to actually pay for the operation and for many uh, uses on that. It is also used for infrastructure decisions. Here I have uh, two examples. One is um, th there was funding uh, to improve the lighting, uh, to, to provide lights in the bus stops, um, to improve uh, safety in, uh, for people who are waiting for the bus. Uh, but there was not enough budget to provide light in all the 11,000 bus stops uh, in the network. Uh, so with information at this level of disaggregation, you can identify the, in this case, the uh, funding was available for, for 1,000 bus stops. So you can identify the 1,000 bus stops that have a higher rate of passengers using them during night hours. So you can focus uh, the investment in improvement of the infrastructure in those uh, bus stops where this will be more useful. Um, other infrastructure decision is, for example, here um, in this uh, graph on, on the left, uh, there are the bus, the bus speeds, and there are some places in the city where uh, the bus speeds, speed is four kilometers per hour which is actually at that speed, uh, you better get off the bus and walk <laughs> because it's really awful. We walk at around five kilometers per hour. Uh, so with this, uh, with this data, you can identify in which parts of the city are those severe speed problems and you can uh, make uh, infrastructure decisions to improve that. Uh, something which is very difficult when you have such a wide uh, system covering all the city. Uh, and what is, of course, more interesting for me is you can do modeling because here you have a huge laboratory. Uh, you have information that we have never had before uh, in, in this uh, amount, uh, precision and uh, timing. We have well, you, you, uh, you see I have been showing you uh, the information about the 2012 Origin Destination sur Survey. Uh, that is many years ago, and we haven't done another one in Santiago. It's very expensive to make an Origin Destination Survey. So we, we are 
using data from a survey that was done when uh, Uber didn't exist. Uh, I don't know, uh, probably Waze didn't exist. I can't even remember the things that didn't exist um, 12 years ago when, when this survey uh, was made. Uh, so we can do modeling. Uh, and here I will show you some results of the PhD uh, thesis of my, student, my former student, Jacqueline Arriagada, who is now a postdoc at the University of Leeds. Um, and what we did in, in Jacqueline's work is to look at models that, that you can formulate to uh, improve our, our knowledge of passenger behavior using uh, this data. So uh, we look at uh, different things. One of those uh, was route choice. Here you can see on, on the left, uh, the bus routes uh, in the Transantiago system. You can see that it is like an, a spaghetti dish. <laughs> uh, very difficult to identify all the alternatives uh, that people have, what, which ones they will consider. Um, at any origin destination you imagine, you probably have many possible combinations of bus and metro, um, bus metro combinations that will take you from an origin to the destination. Also consider that you can walk a little bit from one uh, bus stop to another. So um, one of the first things we look at was how do you build the consideration set, uh, the alternatives that the uh, person making the decision uh, will consider uh, to make their choice, their root choice. So in terms of modeling, uh, we use the uh, multinomial logic model and also the, the path size logic model. Uh, the path size uh, is a model that incorporates correlation between routes, which is very important in, uh, in a network such as this, where many, uh, many of the alternatives have some parts in common. So you have to incorporate a correlation. And we look at uh, different approaches for consideration set that were published in the literature. Um, one of them was labeling, which uh, where uh, you take uh, the, alter uh, the alternative of minimum cost, minimum transfers, different labels uh, by one particular characteristics. And uh, with all of them, you build the consideration set. Another approach to build the consideration set is a link elimination or link penalty, uh, where what you do is take the minimum cost uh, route and then eliminate uh, one link uh, from that alternative or add a penalty uh, and then look for the second uh, uh, shortest path. Similar to the K shortest path method, uh, there is a simulation method where what you do is to add um, to add a, a, a penalty uh, and then look for for the next alternative. There is the combined approach where which is what is proposed is to uh, put all the alternatives identified in all the previous methods. And uh, another one called the historical cohort approach, where what you do is to observe for a particular origin destination pair, all the alternatives used by all the users who travel in that origin destination, uh, which in, in massive uh, databases like the one we have makes very much sense. So uh, we took uh, from our database 260 origin destination pairs in the morning period. And we use uh, three weeks of data for estimation and one, and one week, the fourth, for validation. And uh, in those origin destination pairs, we estimated these models uh, using these different origin destination, uh, these different uh, approaches to the consideration set. We found that most of them uh, provide reasonable results. 
uh, but the only method that provide um, consistent results for all of the variables was the historical cohort method. Uh, because all the other methods, for example, gave a positive sign for the transfer working time, uh, while the historical cohort method was the one that provided uh, the correct sign for all the, the variables that were included in the um, utility function and also uh, was the model that had the better predicted ability, abilities. The other thing we look at uh, was um, find out where there was heterogeneity in the choice strategy. Uh, we have for many years heard about uh, common lines uh, where you design a, you decide a strategy to choose a bus. So you uh, take the, the first bus that comes from a set of uh, common lines and that when any of those bu buses will take you to, uh, to your destination. But uh, we, we don't know for sure how many people or, or if people actually use this common lines approach or it is only a theoretical model. Uh, so we built an indicator uh, where the indicator will be zero if the passenger use common lines, uh, which means that he or she will take the first bus that comes from a set of routes, which provides the uh, optimum, the optimum uh, time to go from origin A to destination D. And um, the indicator will be one if the passenger does not use common lines. It, it, it will wait for a particular bus lines, no matter uh, if a bus comes from the other one, that uh, could be the, the optimal strategy. And what we found is that some people actually use common lines and some other people does not. And there are some people that are in the middle that perhaps sometimes use common lines and, and other times don't. So what we did here is to estimate a latent class models and identify those users who are uh, optimizers that use the, the common line strategies and those who are not, who just wait for, for a particular bus. And we look at the differences between those groups and we, and we found uh, some uh, in terms of perceptions. For example, we found that uh, users who wait for a specific line tend to prefer metro rather than bus. Uh, we found that um, people who uh, wait for a specific line tend to uh, value a walking time as more unpleasant uh, and crowding level as more unpleasant, while um, people who wait for common lines tend to give, give a higher negative value to waiting time. Uh, there were also some differences in how they value uh, the transfer. We, we estimate, we have very big databases, so we can estimate several, param several parameters and we uh, estimated different parameters for transfer from bus to bus, bus to metro or metro to, to bus. And, and we have, we found some differences here in the uh, users who wait for a specific line and uh, users that will choose common lines. And uh, another thing we, we did was to observe a situation where a new metro line was introduced. Uh, and that was very interesting for us because it allows us to uh, evaluate how people learn. Um, this uh, metro line was a, a, a big one. If you can see here in the map, it's metro line six. Uh, it has 10 new stations connecting uh, a large uh, population area, a residential neighborhood with uh, uh, the more commercial area and also connecting with several other metro lines. So it connected uh, many people that did not have metro before uh, 
with the, the rest of the, of the network. Um, so in this case, what we did was to use the instance-based learning model, um, which is a model proposed by uh, Tang et al, 2007, uh, where what we do is to build um, a, a variable that uh, builds the, what we call the perceived travel time based on the previous, previous experience, considering that you learn from using the system how much your travel time will be. And this model has a, a parameter that considers how recent uh, was this experience. So uh, we had this data from the smart card observations. For this, we use uh, frequent passengers only to have enough observations to uh, calibrate this model. We look at the morning peak periods and uh, we consider um, uh, one week prior to the opening of the Metro line. Uh, the well, when we when the metro line opened uh, and uh, five, five weeks after the opening of the uh, metro line. The base model was a path size logic uh, considering considering correlation between routes um, and uh, the um, al the alternative model to the based learning, which was instance-based le learning, which was the, the one we were trying. Um, like the base model was one where we assume that you have knowledge of the system from descriptive information. So the information you have about travel time is the average travel time of the system for that uh, origin destination pair. So we uh, try these two different models. And what we found is that uh, in the first weeks, uh, just after the launch of the Metro line, people behave um, according to the model where you, uh, your decisions are based on descriptive information only. While in the last five weeks, um, we found that uh, the model uh, that consider that you learn from past travel experiences with this instance-based learning model, uh, explain the uh, user's behavior better. And also um, the, this uh, recency parameter was significant, showing that uh, more recent travel experiences are more uh, active in the passenger's memory. So, um, just to, to conclude, I, I want to leave some time for, for questions. Uh, I consider that we have here a, a, a quantum leap uh, on the, uh, on terms of the information availability we have. Uh, this is also very low cost information, really. Uh, it's very easy to, to obtain this from the technological devices uses to operate. Um, Many tools can be developed to improve the planning, operation, and control of the public transport systems. We can really advance on understanding behavior and uh, uh, test hypotheses like uh, we did in, in Jacqueline's thesis. Um, and we have here some very solid grounds to formulate new, I would say better focus, policies uh, based on disaggregate information. Um, I am now working with, uh, we are now working with, with another PhD student on um, developing models that would allow us to uh, change behavior, to induce uh, behavior in, in passengers. We are trying to convince the, the transport authorities uh, to do some, some experiments to uh, make some changes in the fare structure to see how um, the users will um, behave after those changes, how will, they will respond. That will be my, 
my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, fascinating talk. Uh, so um, I guess um, we can, uh, Roger and I uh, can start with yes. questions. Uh, uh, Roger, do you want to start or? Uh, sure, I could start. Uh, and so in your smart card data, do you have any attributes of the uh, travelers themselves? And so you mentioned like differences in strategy in terms of like taking a specific line versus a common line. And actually I find myself more of a specific line waiter uh, when I write mm -hmm. transit systems in different cities. But I think that's a function of me like being less familiar with the system and yeah. wanting to play it safe. So um, it's nice that your smart card data is so massive, right? I've never you know, seen numbers like that in, um, in the past. And so that's definitely great. But I think, you know, having some attributes of the travelers uh, in terms of their um, characteristics can also help, you know, understand how to design systems for them better. So. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Uh, we wish we had more. We have very few. <laughs> well, of course, there yeah. are some uh, confidentiality issues that we have mm -hmm. to be very sure. careful with that. Um, from the from the whole mass of cars, we don't have any social demographic information, but we can infer some. For example, you can infer where, whether someone is a frequent traveler or not. Uh, in, in that last example I show uh, that we choose frequent travelers only. Um, you can also observe their travel pattern. Uh, and actually we have estimated zone of residence for them because uh, if the, well, actually what we did was to uh, observe the location where, uh, where you did the, your first transaction in the morning, your first morning transaction. But I am now convinced that it's probably even easier than that. If you find the most frequent location, it will, it will probably be uh, the, the zone of residence, the, the uh, location of residence of, of people. Uh, and Santiago is a very segregated city. So if you know zone of residence, you can have an estimation of level of income. Uh, some neighborhoods are wealthier than, than other and, and you can use zone of residence as a proxy of, um, uh, of uh, income. Uh, and the other thing we had uh, is uh, whether the, the car was a regular car or a student car. So we can differentiate students from regular users. Uh, now, for if, if you want more detailed behavioral models, then you what we, you will probably have to do is what we did in, in these validation surveys to um, recruit some volunteers or, or recruit some users who are willing to participate in an experiment and provide their uh, social demographic information and participate in, in a study. So yeah, for, ex for, for this experiment, I, I was mentioned that we would like to, to do with uh, my current student uh, in collaboration with the transfer authorities. We are uh, aiming at that, at uh, getting an um, agreement, uh, a consent yeah. agreement signed so we can have access to more detailed social demographic uh, information of a sample of users. Okay, great. Well, it sounds like there are workarounds, so that's uh, yeah. it's good that there's options. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I have two questions, um, and I, I see also uh, Mike Florian's in the audience, so it's, mm. it's great that you have uh, this topic on uh, common lines. Uh, um, so one of my questions re relates to that. Uh, so the uh, so basically, you're you're differentiating uh, people who are kind of following that versus people you know, people who might not do so. Uh, did, were were you also uh, observing? Uh, the amount of uh, information that was available to those travelers. Uh, so whether or not they're, they're making use of uh, um, uh, vehicle arrival times, uh, real time information uh, and, and making those kind of decisions. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. We don't know actually uh, which information they have uh, and, <laughs> and there is a lot of information available. 
we have uh, some applications where you can um, you can look at the at the bus and how much time uh, uh, will pass until the the bus arrives. Uh, so we think that those classes probably have to do with that. Uh, and, and that makes your traveler experience very different because if you know at what time the bus will arrive, uh, then your uh, valuation of uh, waiting time drops significantly because it, it, uh, you, you eliminate the, the uncertainty. Uh, so yeah, that's something that we don't know. We, we make some assumptions. We, we, have anal we have been analyzing the results of this, thinking about uh, that type of thing, but, but we cannot know uh, a priori. Uh, we can only know, well, um, we have also, well, Jacqueline, my, my former student, she also de developed an app for the users and uh, they have, uh, she with some other students uh, made this company that uh, made this application called Transap that has a very large amount of users. Mm -hmm. So for those those users, you can know, uh, but yeah. not for the rest. Um, yeah, not for the rest. Um, and then many fun second... things to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, for the second question, well, before I ask the second question, uh, just to the general audience. Uh, Please feel free to uh, type in your questions uh, while I'm asking the second question, so uh, Natalia can uh, uh, help uh, uh, try convey those questions uh, to Marcella. Um, so for the second question relates to the learning uh, uh, for the, the, the last topic. Uh, I, I thought that was really quite interesting, and I was wondering if uh, you can take those lessons learned and uh, design uh, specific policy interventions that uh, can take advantage of knowing that uh, people have spe specific, uh, 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 I guess, memory of uh, memory yeah. rates of, of uh, pre previous experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, Roger said I, I'm now in the in the board of of directors of Metro, uh, and we are about to to launch some extensions. And this, uh, what we learned from the from the previous introduction of a new line. It's very important for, for us to plan uh, for the incorporation of, of, the, of the new ones. So yeah, uh, it's very useful to, to learn uh, about user's behavior in, in this incorporation of, of new lines. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Natalia? Uh, yes, thank you so much for the talk. I really encourage the audience to ask a few questions in the chat, but I do have a few questions prepared, uh, mm -hmm. particularly about the card and the timeline, because collecting and analyzing and processing such a large data set, I imagine it takes a substantial effort. So my first question, if you can tell us a little bit more about the timeline, if someone would like to endeavor such a large data collection and processing, and my other question relates to the card itself, because since it was in 2012, um, 2013, and a lot of things has ha have changed, now the card could be arguably linked to a bike share program outside of those stations, or you could pay with the card for scooters, whatnot. Uh, what are your thoughts of, on that? Or maybe it already exists. Is, is that an opportunity? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, regarding processing time, um, we have advanced a lot. <laughs> well, computers are now faster uh, than 10 years ago. At the, at the beginning, I was saying uh, we took a huge amount of time to process all the data. Now we can do it really fast. Uh, one, one big change we did was to move from processing a whole week to processing one day at a time. Uh, it, you, you can gain a lot in terms of uh, uh, efficiency and you don't, you don't lose uh, that much. Uh, uh, one, one of the things we did was that to estimate the, um, the uh, alighting for the last transaction of the day, we, we, use, we look at the first transaction in the morning or the first in the next day. Well, the only thing you lose uh, when you process one day of the time is that you cannot look at the 
uh, first transaction of the next day. You have to look at the first transaction in the same day. But we discovered that people aren't as adventurous and as we thought that most of people actually spend their nights at, at the same place. So there, there wasn't that much uh, to lose on, on that. Uh, now, regarding the uses of the car, actually, cars have not changed much since 2012, actually since 2008, which was when, when they were introduced. The only thing we have introduced is this possibility to uh, use QR uh, and to pay with the mobile phone. Uh, but that will probably change soon. Um, the, the, the government is thinking about uh, making a, a program with a different fair structure, thinking about a fair capping uh, program and um, Metro is, is um, thinking about uh, making a program where you can use the, uh, a car to uh, pay for the public transport and also to pay for uh, the convenience stores uh, at metro stations, uh, so that that is about to change. It hasn't occurred yet, uh, but it will probably do that. Now I, I see that as an opportunity. Uh, when that happens, we will have more data to play with, <laughs> and probably yeah, uh, to incorporate, for example, bike share and scooters. That would be uh, very nice because then you you will be able to observe the those these combined trips, those cases where the exact origin of the trips was farther than the origin, farther than one kilometer. So you did not uh, get to the bus stop or to the train station walking by walking. Thank you. And I do have a follow-up question on that because I'm curious about the policies that you would recommend because given such a large metropolitan area, I would assume that in certain times of the day that buses would get congested. So I, I'm curious, I'm sure you, you, you thought of that with your team. What policies based on the data would you recommend to the transit agency uh, to implement to kind of you know flex work hours or maybe some incentives to equally distribute the users across the network? Ooh, that's a very difficult uh, question. Uh, actually, I would say that something uh, useful that of this data is that you can look at the extremes of the distribution and, and those very rare events that have a significant uh, effect. Uh, well, you, you mentioned crowding. Um, a challenge we have is to keep passengers in the public transport system and hopefully to increase the percentage of, of users uh, using public transport. So some, something we have been looking at is uh, who are those users who abandon the public transport system and, and how, what can you do to um, keep them in the system? Because for example, if you think uh, of uh, introducing more, uh, for example, uh, more resources to the system could be to increase frequency and, and you uh, reduce the travel time in average one minute. So from 31 to 30, that will probably mean nothing in the average. Uh, for me, I don't care if I, if, if, my travel time diminishes from 31 to 30 minutes. But if you reduce significantly the travel time for those users who travel two hours, for example, mm. that will be significant. And that will make those users not to think in of buying a car as soon as they can, uh, because the, the, their um, time was significantly reduced. Um, or, or, for example, to um, increase the regularity in, in some very irregular uh, services where you have, you may have six buses in an, in an hour, but you have six buses that arrive together and then none until the next hour. Uh, those types of things happen in our network. Well, I showed you some areas where the, the bus speeds, uh, the speed of buses was four kilometers. 
So mm -hmm. you can do something there. Uh, the the nice thing about this data is is that you can focus. Uh, you can uh, uh, focus the resources where they are really needed, where they can really make a difference. And and the transport authorities use this a lot. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one last question from the audience. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, hand it to uh, Roger and Joseph to start concluding. But if anyone still has any remaining points, please share. Yeah, feel free to just write it in the chat window or share. I'm not sure if there are any in the chat window I can't see. Going once, going twice. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Well, we, we're about at the end of our um, time commitment here. So we have about three minutes left. Uh, so I'll go ahead and close it. So thank you, Marcelo. That was a very interesting talk. And um, it's very timely for us in Hawaii because um, the rail that, that has been planning since the 80s is finally opening in two weeks. Uh, well. So people, people will actually be able to ride it. It's a smart car uh, system. And so everyone... The city is excited about it, and um, and it's uh, matches the timing of your talk uh, very well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so just a reminder to everyone uh, before everyone departs, uh, this uh, webinar was sponsored by uh, the subcommittee on route choice and spatial temporal processes. So if you thought uh, if you thought Marcel's talk was interesting, please do um, reach out to Joseph or myself or Natalia about um, helping out with the committee and being involved. And of course, please do come to our meeting at the annual meeting in January when it does occur. Um, this is our second uh, webinar of our summer series. Uh, and so we have one more uh, from Song Gao uh, coming up next. And so please be on the lookout for that announcement and uh, same logistics. Uh, so uh, please register for this uh, webinar when, when you see the announcement come out. We're still confirming details. Oh, Roger. okay. Sorry. Okay. Jumped yes. the gun there a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Well, it'll be someone but... awesome. Yes. <laughs> if not, yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess with that, uh, we'll conclude it right there. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and so yes, uh, I guess see you at the next webinar. Thank you. So Thank you, Marcella. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It was okay. really a pleasure. Yeah. Thank Thanks you so you. much. Bye.